Hi all, and thank you for joining the session. My name is Saad Malik. I'm the CTO and co-founder of Spectral Cloud. So today we'll be talking about the next phase of Kubernetes management, specifically looking at what is decorative management and how to do so with cluster API. A, a little bit more about myself. So I'm the guy who likes to build and tinker with new technologies, especially in the areas of Linux, virtualizations, and containers. I was part of an early cloud startup called Clicker Technologies, where we focused on multi-cloud application management. And it is actually where, where we first started working with Docker containers and container orchestration platforms like Apache Mesos and the early versions of Kubernetes. So Clicker was acquired by Cisco in 2016. And by then we started seeing firsthand just how quickly the world was changing, where organizations and enterprises across all verticals were transforming themselves into, into technology first companies and beginning to adopt cloud native technologies like containers and Kubernetes to drive their application experiences for their customers and for, uh, for their employees. So in 2019, along with other key executives from Clipper Technologies, we left to start Spectral Cloud to really focus on making Kubernetes accessible and approachable for everyone. So let's take a step back and let's take a look at where are we today with Kubernetes adoption. As all of you know, Kubernetes has become that de facto standard in running containers. It's become that common control plane or a common operating system that not only helps you build your applications, but also helps you manage your application. Now, not only are containers and Kubernetes usage and adoption increasing, but it is also accelerating. And with current research indicating that the number of new clusters, which will be going into production is gonna be very fast increase. So why is this? Well, if you take a look at the promise of Kubernetes from the very beginning, Kubernetes promised a very robust and scalable container orchestration platform with promises of true portability of your workloads and at the same time being able to help drive efficiencies. It was meant to be the holy nirvana. The unfortunate truth is, and the hard reality, is that Kubernetes really hasn't lived up to its expectations. And I'll talk a little bit more about why I think some of the reasons for this case. So when you talk about Kubernetes, it's not just one thing. Kubernetes, we're cobbling together dozens of different sub integrations across the ecosystem. Today in the CNCF landscape, there are over 1,700 different integrations from many different layers from monitoring, logging, security, service mesh, ingress, and many more. And when practitioners of Kubernetes start integrating these tools and technologies into their Kubernetes clusters, the complexity is not just about managing individually each of these integrations, but also making sure that they play nice with each other. So Kubernetes, if you think about it, is just a piece of software. It's the control plane components like your API server, your etcd, scheduler, et cetera, and an agent called a kubelet, which runs on the worker nodes. If you ask the industry and vendors, what is Kubernetes, they will tell you it's actually four different layers, the operating system, the Kubernetes, the networking and the storage. But what we believe is that Kubernetes is the total value and experience that it provides to the users of Kubernetes. So essentially whatever your developers and DevOps need on a daily basis with all of their logging and monitoring and security, all those integrations that are completely baked in. This is a, a real screenshot of our product palette, um, and that's a real stack of all the various integrations. Uh, what we find is that typically customers add 12 to 15 different types of integrations into any one cluster. Again, everything from your logging, your monitoring, your ingress, all these different layers and integrations. Switching to Kubernetes management, there are two different groups. There are the DevOps and IT teams, right? Mainly teams that are responsible for running the Kubernetes clusters, managing the clusters, and of course, managing the complexity of those clusters. And then there are the developers who really don't care about the Kubernetes, specifically don't care about the lifecycle of Kubernetes, but what they do care about are the various stacks and layers, the application services that run inside of the Kubernetes cluster. That's because their code and their applications are consuming these fast dependencies. 
So where are all of these complexities coming from? Well, the first dimension, which complicates things are the, the different locations or environments where Kubernetes can be deployed. Uh, whether, you know, where the infrastructure itself can be a public cloud, it could be a private cloud, data center, bare metal, and even edge. Uh, we're seeing lots of new interesting use cases where users and customers are running Kubernetes at the edge environments. The other angle of complexity is around managing multiple different development teams. Large organizations don't just have one development team, they have multiple. And within those development teams, they might have different diverse projects with their own unique requirements and needs. Uh, in the end, they all have these requirements in terms of what their Kubernetes needs to look like, what the entire stack needs to look like. And the third dimension that complicates things is time. It's easy to design and potentially deploy what we call day zero and day one, but things get complicated as your business requirements and ultimately your application requirements change over time. So basically what you're talking about in Kubernetes is a multi-dimensional kind of rubrics cube that is very difficult to manage you know, across all those different environments that you have to support, across the different teams and their unique requirements, and also with the changing business requirements um, as time goes on. So how can cluster API help? Well, if you take a look at the typical adoption of customers on Kubernetes, customers start at the experimentation phase, which is frequently initiated by the development teams. But as more and more critical workloads come onto these clusters, ownership of these clusters moves from development to IT operations or platform engineering teams. And these teams look to solutions and products that can help manage these clusters and their life cycles. In the experimentation phase, there is a disconnected experience when it comes to managing the different layers, right? Your IT ops and your DevOps engineers have to manage the machines, right? The operating system, the core Kubernetes layers, and all the various additional add-on services which sit on top. Uh, many of these could be facilitated, facilitated by scripts, uh, which are obviously very costly to build and maintain over time, especially as you start looking across different environments. Now, this is where Cluster API really comes in, is at least for the infrastructure layers, it provides a unified experience to manage the core layers. So everything in the infrastructure from managing the machines, the operating system, the Kubernetes layers can now all be managed using a simplified unified experience. Going a little bit deeper into Cluster API. So Cluster API is one of the most popular Kubernetes orchestration tools. Uh, it is governed by cluster lifecycle SIG, uh, CNCF SIG, which is a special interest group for all Kubernetes projects, um, has a massive community and a massive vendor adoption where most modern Kubernetes management platforms from VMware Tanzu to Google Anthos, even early versions of Red Hat OpenShift are all utilizing cluster API for its ability to cohesively manage the clusters and their life cycles in any environment. And what really sets Cluster API apart from other tools is its declarative approach to managing the lifecycle of the Kubernetes clusters. And the key here being that it does provision the underlying infrastructure, like the compute, the storage, the networking, and all the layers, and all, all of this with the common day two capabilities, like scaling the number of nodes, adding additional pool sizes, upgrading Kubernetes version, and many, many more all out of the box. So why should you start thinking about managing your infrastructure and your clusters as code? Well, if you think about it, the way we manage our Kubernetes constructs today, like our namespaces, our deployments, our services, our back, they're all managed as a declarative model. So declarative models by nature are desired state-based systems, are desired state-based system, and of course inherit all the benefits of such a system and you know, everything from having a very simple and small configuration, which are very easy to read to where we don't have to specify how to do something, uh, but more in terms of what needs to be done. And in many cases, these desired state-based systems are self-healing and auto-recovering. 
all of these benefits are should also be extended down into managing the life cycle of your infrastructure, you know, specifically your Kubernetes clusters. And that is essentially what cluster API allows operators to do. Again, with the very simple configuration, it's very simple to read and it's intuitive. It describes what the desired state needs to be and not how to do it. And with just a few lines of code or YAML, you can provision end-to-end -end Kubernetes clusters regardless of the environment. So now the way Cluster API is built is using a really cool plugin architecture called providers, which allows vendors and operators to add support for the favorite cloud or environment. Now, whether it's public clouds like, like Azure, Google, Amazon, or whether it's private clouds like VMware or OpenStack or any other number of environments. What these CAPI or Cluster API providers allow you to do is essentially talk to these endpoints to provision the IaaS layers. In this case, it could be the compute, the VMs, the storage, the networking. And then on top of it, once you have the infrastructure provision, using Cloud Init or similar technologies, initialize the Kubernetes on top of it. The, Kuberne the cluster API runs in a Kubernetes management cluster. Um, and essentially an operator using this declarative YAMLs for describing your clusters, your machines, the configuration, feeds all of those YAMLs into the Kubernetes management cluster that is running cluster API. And then using the providers are able to provision end-to-end -end clusters into any environment. Um, initially, as customers are first exploring technologies like cluster API, they might just manually be creating the actual, the CRDs or the custom resources in the management clusters. Uh, but over time, as they start scaling, they would bring in some GitOps approach like Argo CD or Flux. So with that, uh, let's get into a short demo uh, where we can first show how to provision an EKS cluster. And then we'll do some day two operations on an existing EKS cluster, and then show the experience of provisioning bare metal clusters, which should be identical to how you provision a, a public cloud cluster. Okay, I'm jumping into my terminal. So the first thing to note is I have a management cluster, a kind cluster running on my laptop, but the management cluster could be any public cloud cluster, could be any private cloud cluster, it doesn't really matter. If I take a look at all the pods that are running in this cluster, uh, you'll notice that I have a, all the CAPI cluster API pods running, the control plane ones, and two of the providers. Uh, one of the providers is cluster API Amazon, which is for provisioning either Amazon clusters directly on IaaS or the EKS clusters. And then I also have a provider for CAPI MAS, which is Canonical's Metal as a Service. Uh, what we're going to do next is actually provision a brand new cluster on EKS. So what we can do is we can take a look at what are the different declarative resources needed to provision a cluster on EKS using cluster API. Uh, the very first resource that you'll see us defining is a cluster resource, which defines all the common attributes that go into a cluster, right? Everything from your pod, your cider blocks, and then you specify one or more controller plane refs and infrastructure ref. In case of Amazon, how do I provision EKS cluster? So here I've specified, I'm using the Amazon managed control plane and I'll be provisioning uh, using that. Uh, for the Amazon managed control plane, you can specify constructs like what are the actual VPCs and what are the subnets to deploy into. And here you can notice that I've specified an existing subnet and existing VPC configuration. Cluster API on Amazon does allow you to also dynamically provision even the VPCs and subnets dynamically. So, so if we didn't specify any of these constructs, they would be automatically provisioned by Cluster API. Uh, once you're defining the cluster properties, you also define your node pool properties. These are defining the different pools of worker VMs that are gonna be joining into the cluster. So I've defined an EKS pool four, an EKS four pool, and I've specified, I want the replica count to be three. Essentially, this worker pool is gonna have three instances out of the box. Oh, and by the way, for the instances, the Amazon managed machine pool is targeting an instance type of T3 medium and deploy them across AZ1 and AZ2. I'm gonna go ahead and apply this actual configuration, kubectl apply 20 EKS, right? And notice that at this point in time, 
the CAPI are beginning to provision the cluster end-to-end. -end. Uh, cluster API and CAPI do provide a very simple CLI to be able to quickly in introspect the state of different clusters. So I can run a command to say kubectl get clusters, right? These should be all the clusters that were either provisioned previously or are currently provisioning. So in this case, we are provisioning now this EKS4. And then I can run this cluster cuddle describe command and I can specify EKS4 here. And it'll show me as that cluster is being provisioned on Amazon, you know, what, what does it look like? Uh, I'm not gonna wait for this cluster to finish provisioning. Instead, I'm gonna show an existing cluster. So for there, I'm gonna go back to kubectl uh, get clusters. And notice that we have already a EKS3 cluster running. I can describe this cluster state, right? And notice that the cluster is fully up and running and in a healthy state. Uh, using the cluster cuddle command, we can also download the cube config file. So if I type in uh, da, 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 cluster cuddle get cube config, and I can specify download it for, excuse me. And I can say download this for my EKS3 cluster and save it into a file called kubeconfig-eks3. Um, and then using a different terminal, I can go ahead and set and this kubeconfig file. And then now if I run a command like kubectl get pods, right, give it about five seconds or so, these are all the pods that are running in my provision cluster, my EKS3 cluster. Um, I can of course run another pod, like run a Nginx application, call it hello3, and then within a few seconds, you should see a brand new application being launched onto the EKS cluster. So that was uh, basic provisioning of the cluster and obviously being able to access a cube config. We can also do some day two operations. Uh, for example, uh, we can perhaps scale up the number of nodes that are running inside of, the, inside of this cluster. So the way to do that is go into the replica count field, specify the new numbers. So we're saying go from two nodes to three nodes. And then as soon as I go ahead and apply that, right, within a few, uh, within a few minutes, a brand new node should be added into this cluster. Uh, just real quickly, the, the, this is all about Amazon, right? Being able to have a simple unified experience with cluster API to provision clusters on an EKS managed Kubernetes service. If you are looking for support on vSphere, OpenStack, even bare metal, it's a very similar, 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 similar unified declarative file. Uh, what we're gonna do next is provision a cluster on bare metal systems. So we can take a look at a, a, an actual declaration for MAS, which is the Canonical's metal as a service offering. And what MAS allows you to do is manage the lifecycle of bare metal systems. You know, whether they are super micros or Dells or HP machines, they support a number of different variety of options and be able to manage what is the operating system and provision inside of it and all the configuration that is maintained. Uh, if you take a look at this MAS cluster or bare metal cluster configuration, it is very similar. You start off with a cluster configuration um, and then you specify MAS specific properties, like what is a DNS name to attach for the cluster when it gets provisioned. For the actual worker nodes, for the worker machine pools, you specify these MAS machine templates and very similarly to Amazon, where you specify which instance type and which region, MAS has a concept of a failure domain or an AZ. So you can specify, I want to provision machines that are coming out of AZ2 that have at least a minimum of two CPU cores and a four gigs of memory. And then you can specify other aspects like, you know, hey, what are the replica counts for my worker machines, for my master machine, all of this configuration using a very similar type of APIs can be managed. Um, if we go ahead and provision this declaration, so if it's a uh, provision now, the, the mass cluster, notice that all the resources are created. I can run a describe command and I can specify here my cluster mass one, right? And you should see that it's already beginning to provision the control plane node. And once the control plane node is fully provisioned, it's gonna provision the worker nodes. Uh, same day two operations in terms of being able to do upgrades, being able to do scaling operations, all of those are supported exactly the same way, even for, even for bare metal systems. 
So that was a, a, a short demo of cluster API. Uh, you saw how, saw how we are able to simplify the provisioning of clusters, both in public environments and bare metal environments. But is this all that's needed to manage Kubernetes? So let's take a look at where we left the complexity. So even with cluster API success at unifying the core Kubernetes orchestration, IT operations and platform engineering teams still have to do, deal with the complexity of the various integrations and applications, which are requirements for the development teams. And we think this is where there is a, a big gap because just how CAPI and, and Kubernetes with a declarative model is able to manage their layers, we think even the integrations and application services that DevOps and platform engineering teams are providing needs to be managed entirely. Uh, this is what we define as the full stack of being able to extend the unification of the core layers from the operating system, the Kubernetes networking storage, but do it for the entire complete stack, including the myriad of difference of integrations and application services that different teams do. Uh, and this is the focus of Spectre Cloud. So we took the concept of cluster API and essentially built our own orchestration around it, extending it to all the additional layers on top of it. And we added the day zero design, day one deploy and day two management functionality to support any operation, especially in day two. We support all the various target environments that Cluster API has from public cloud, private data centers, bare metal and edge. Um, and we also support importing existing clusters and provide the same set of day zero, day one and day two capabilities. This is a product is Spectral Cloud Palette. It's a Kubernetes management plane that lets operators operate production grade Kubernetes clusters with ease. And Palette does provide that peace of mind to fully manage all your clusters in a declarative approach with all the various integrations and add-ons and layers with many of the day two operations out of the box from backup restore to RBAC management, even cost visibility at the infra level or even in the Kubernetes level. And then speaking about environments, um, we do support all the cluster API environments that they have, but we also introduced a new unique approach for managing Kubernetes at the edge. There is a, with edge, there are new requirements in terms of simplifying operations, keeping it plug and play. And you wanna be able to scale to thousands or tens of thousands of locations. Uh, with Palo, we've been able to provide a holistic approach to manage them. Now, the way we manage clusters at scale and how we simplify management of clusters is through a concept of what we call cluster profiles. Think of it like a blueprint or a template for provisioning multiple clusters, regardless of the environment or cloud, and using the same blueprint for managing the day one and day two actions of these clusters. Palette is designed to work with your existing tool sets and tool chains. Uh, there are a number of different out-of-the-box options for Kubernetes integrations and add-ons in our public repositories from different components that deal with logging and monitoring security, whatever common tooling and technologies enterprise customers need today. All of these integrations have been pre-validated and pre-tested and are always kept up to date. But of course, customers do have the ability to bring in their own content in their own private repositories or bring in their own private Helm charts. So our UI does provide a simple interface for users to learn and operate the platform. But as users become more sophisticated, and especially as they start scaling to tens or hundreds of clusters, automation becomes critical. So there is strong automation support in Spectral Cloud Palette, both in Terraform and Ansible and many of the different layers. Terraform today is the number one downloaded provider uh, for container orchestration, where customers can use it to manage all the various aspects of their clusters. So that's the end of the presentation. Um, please do come and talk to us wherever you are in your cloud native and Kubernetes journey. Whether you're starting now or moving your containers to production, we can help you simplify the way you manage your Kubernetes environments. If you are interested in Palace and what it brings to the table, we are offering free access for the first five folks with a real Kubernetes project. So please do reach out if you're interested. Uh, beyond Palette, if you have any questions on Kubernetes or Cluster API, uh, myself and my team would be very happy to help out. 
So feel free to email me at sod at spectrecloud.com or tweet at me at SAA Mullick. And with that, thank you so much for watching.